Fast Forward Productions. The women are speaking. It's tuning out the noise and the nonsense and not succumbing to hustle culture where you're feeling less than or behind, but really owning who you are right here, right now. And it doesn't mean that you can't have aspirations in your personal and professional life and you can't meet goals, but you'll get there when you get there. You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer. We're sowing seeds of slow living through our community platform, events, and online marketplace. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm, one that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now. The farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. So come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's dig in. Good morning. How are you today, mom? Very good. And when this goes live, it will be March 1st, believe it or not. Most importantly, the beginning of my birthday month. Yes. (laughs) And the spring equinox. And also this month, we have an early Easter, March 31st. That's right. It's very early. It's early for Easter, but it moves because Easter is determined by the first full moon after the spring equinox. So sometimes it does fall in March. Not as often as in early April, but this year, March 31st. And we have an extra day in February too. So yesterday. Yeah. So I hope everyone did something really lucky and fun yesterday. And also Monday begins officially the Slow Living Challenge, which we're very excited about. And if you haven't joined us yet, we are on Substack for that. The link is in the show notes. What the challenge means is simply we have prompts for every day. We'll be sending out those prompts on Monday of that week, the three weeks starting this coming Monday, March 4th. And a couple of fun things we're adding on Monday evening, we'll be doing a fun casual Zoom gathering for anyone doing the slow living challenge as a little kickoff. We want to hear about you and where you're coming from and why you're doing the slow living challenge. And also it's a chance for us to show you our new home in Substack. And this challenge is open and free for everyone. We hope to continue doing other challenges and things in the future through our Substack, And we are playing around with, you know, for the paid subscriber community members, what that looks like. And I'm just so excited. We have so many awesome things. If you do choose to join the community at a paid subscription level, you'll get access to our resource vault, we're calling it, of all of our recommendations, things we love, books we love, our favorite products. You know, we get asked all the time what for a specific category I'm looking for. You know, where do I look? So we're putting all of that into our Substack as well. You want to be there. You want to join the Soul Living Challenge. And also, it's just the coolest people that find each other through stuff like this. If you like this podcast, I imagine you would like other people who like this podcast. So that's fun, too. That Zoom meeting on Monday night, March 4th, 2024, is a really fun time to meet some of our listeners, some of you guys. So come on in. Yes. Link in the show notes. I can't think of a better way to start out to kick off the Soul Living Challenge weekend than with our guest for today. The queen of slow living herself, Stephanie O'Day, who somehow she has the slow living podcast and she's the queen of slow living and slow cooking. And yet she does so much. It's really amazing, but she's a wonderful human and we're so excited to have her back on. Yes. And if you heard our previous interview with Stephanie, you'll know the story of how an idea for a way to stay home with her kids led to a blog and the website called a year of slow cooking. And this was followed by TV appearances, book contracts, life coaching, and the podcast, the Slow Living Podcast. Stephanie works with clients to help them live the life they've always wanted. She asks, what if you could design the life of your dreams and then live it out 
in real time? What if you could truly have it all? We know that so many of you were truly inspired and loved her episode from a year and a half ago. That was episode 110 when she first came on the podcast. It was our most frequently downloaded episode from last year. It's called Designing the Life of Your Dreams, episode 110. And wow, it really resonated with you guys. So we were so excited to have her back on and hear more from her and where she is now and the life update. And yeah, there is so much wrapped up in this slow living and sustainability conversation. It's so multifaceted. And I truly think that it comes back to how do we want to live and how are we going to live the best version of who we are individually and as a community. So Stephanie is a great person to speak to all of that. So here she is, Stephanie O'Day, author, coach, and host of the Slow Living Podcast. Day. I am a New York Times bestselling author. I've written 10 books. I write, coach, teach, and speak about all things slow living. And when we first talked 18 months ago, I had just launched the Slow Living Podcast. And we're now, I think, right around the 119, 120th episode. And I've learned a lot. And hopefully, I kind of maybe sort of know a little bit more than I did way back then about slow living and and what people are craving and wanting. And I think what people want is they want to find a way to meet their personal goals and their professional goals, but not in this like hustle, more, 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 go, go, go way, but in a way that feels calm and slow and steady and sustainable. And so I think that's why my audience and your audience have overlap. And thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much for coming back. And I want to hear what's evolved in your life since we talked to you a year and a half ago and what's changed for you. The podcast is fantastic. I didn't realize that I wanted this. I felt like there was a void and I wanted to reach more people. I love writing. I love writing, but I'm not super visual. So the the Pinteresty stuff and the Instagrammy stuff and and taking the picture and making it look a certain way has never appealed to me, probably because I don't want to take the time to learn proper lighting and and how to do all that kind of stuff. But the podcast medium of just speaking and kind of having my brain do the stream of conscious and then having it captured is quite similarly to how I write. I write how I speak. And so it it really feels good and authentic. And it's such a fun way for me to meet many, many people all over the world that I wouldn't have had a chance to come across without this medium. And, And my hat is off to you because I was listening to your podcast early on and liked many <laughs> of the topics that you guys discussed. And, and I, we just have similar interests and similar wants. And and I am, well, I, I joke that I'm a gardener, but really I've mostly kept the kids alive. I enjoy gardening to the point where if I'm like weeding a patch, it's so obvious what I've done and what still needs to do. Mm-hmm. And it's really gratifying Mm -hmm. where sometimes when I'm riding and I have these thoughts and these ideas, there's just more and more and more. And I never feel like I've done enough. Whereas when I'm, I'm cultivating in the backyard or playing around in the front yard, there's a starting point and an ending point, and then I can walk away and really feel satisfied. So it's a nice mirroring of the two. That's so true. It's so much easier. It's like easier to stop or it's easier to feel like you've done something. I think that's the way it is with a lot of hands-on things. And that's why I think using your hands is talked about so much when we talk about slow living. And there's even research that shows that there's an association with your brain and creating the endorphins that when you're making and doing things with your hand, it creates the feel-good hormone and it makes you feel calm. And also, to your point, Stephanie, doing things where you you can see results quickly. Yeah, yeah the productivity button gets pushed <laughs> in my brain yeah, where I'm yeah. like, oh, look at what I did. <laughs> you can see it. Exactly. And it's so easy to get someone else and go, hey, come here, let me show you what I did. Look, yeah, see. It's very gratifying. <laughs> it's very, like, very gratifying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's true. I mentioned last time that I live in Silicon Valley and so I'm surrounded 
by techie type people and people who work online and, and I work online as well. And it's hard to see the fruits of your labor. It's, it's hard to actually point out to someone, well, I did work today when there's really nothing to show for it. So I like that. I, li I like home improvement projects. I'm not a big crafter. My mom is. My mom is an excellent seamstress and she knits and she crochets. And I can see from watching her how gratifying it is to turn a ball of yarn into a hat for a baby and that she brings to the homeless shelter and things like that. It, it's very gratifying. Sort of along those lines, since I've really recently listened to our last conversation, I have a couple of specific follow-up questions. But before that, I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak, if you have any more thoughts to what you've just said about 80 episodes later of your Slow Living podcast, what kinds of things you've learned about slow living or how you've thought about it differently, if at all, and kind of where you are with it right now. And what people are looking for when they're talking about it. I think there's two kind of thoughts patterns. And I think to simplify it, it's whether or not you're type A or type B. The type A people really can tell that their cortisol levels are raised and it doesn't feel good and they feel frantic and they can tell that they're on the brink of burnout and feeling overwhelmed, but they still want to meet their goals because they don't want to laze around the house and feel lazy. They want all of this stuff to happen that they've been dreaming about and working towards. And then there's the, the kind of type B personality who always has been kind of slower and more relaxed and doesn't have that overdrive part of their personality, but they still know that they're a full-fledged human adult and they need to do the things. They need to pay the bills. They need to keep the house clean. They need to get the kids off to school. They need to do these things, but they don't want to be a type A over the top control freak, for lack of a better term, kind of like manic psycho E type person. So then they're drawn to the slow living approach. I am kind of a little bit of both and that I have parts of my personality that absolutely are, are kind of type A over the top controlling. And then other parts where if I'm not doing anything, I feel lazy and I feel unproductive. Whereas if I'm just listening to my body, sometimes my body wants to take a nap, but then my brain is like, yeah, but Steph, you've got this, this, and this you're supposed to do. But when you're calm and you're, and you're slow and you really take the time to listen to your body and, and ask it, what do you need right now? What is it you're trying to achieve? Usually the answer is to slow down and, and that it's going to be okay. Like, like there's no time limit on, on meeting these arbitrary goals. If you've got a five-year plan and it takes you seven years, does that really mean you failed? I don't think so. To me, failing is, is giving up. But if you're just slowly and thoughtfully and methodically making your way forward, you'll get there when you get there. Yeah, that's such a good reminder, man. So easy to forget. I'm remembering what you said in our last conversation that really resonated with me. You said, if we're lucky, and I've discovered this myself in my own life, if we're lucky, you get to live a long time. And these things play out over a long, long time. And I've just experienced that so much in my own life. You know, things that I, I wanted to accomplish in my 30s and 40s, and I would get very frustrated because it wasn't happening very fast. And over the years, literally, decades, you see things starting to play out. You know, if you hold on to them as goals and if you, and, and desires, and if you, you picture yourself having or doing these things, and I can't say like in every instance or promise this will happen to people, but in my experience has been that these things do play out, but they play out very slowly. That's such a refreshing thing to hear too, from like a couple of Older ladies, that is really great. <laughs> hey, you old. careful, Emma. We're going to cancel you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Moms. You know, I'll say it was a mom. I know. Mom no, but no, but it's it's true. It's true, and I'm happy to mom you whenever. Although you've got you've got a pretty awesome mom, but but it is true, and I think a lot of it. I mean, in school, they teach you about smart goals, which is the specific and measured and action and result oriented and on a timeline. And sure, maybe, maybe if you're in a corporate world and you have a certain concrete deadline, no matter what, you have to work backwards so you get the research done and the project done. 
But in real life, like having a smart goal to take a family trip to Hawaii, that doesn't even make sense. I stand by that if we're lucky, life is long. And it will happen, but it's not going to happen in a way that makes you feel like you failed if by January 1st, you thought you were going to do this, that, or the other, and it doesn't come to fruition until April 1st. It really, truly doesn't matter. And I think also in school, and especially in higher education, you're told exactly what to do. And, and you're told the deadlines and you're told the due dates. And all you have to do is, is follow the list, follow the list that someone else has created and go down it and check it off. And that's success. You have just earned yourself an A. But once you're a grown up and, and you get to decide what your life looks like and what's important, you might not want that certain kind of car or that certain kind of house or to go on this vacation versus that vacation. I personally love road trips. I like going slow. I like taking my time. I like deciding, hey, you know what? Let's stop at this truck stop right now and get peanut M&Ms because I truly think actually peanut M&Ms are the best snack of all time. And why wouldn't you want to munch on them on a road trip? I would much rather do that even if it takes three days than fly and be uncomfortable and, and crammed and not be able to change my mind. That doesn't mean I'm doing it wrong or anyone else is doing it wrong. So I wanted to tie what we were just saying about, you know, things you want to accomplish and hopes and dreams that you have for yourself playing out over a long period of time to a podcast episode that you did where you were talking about manifestation. And that's something you hear a lot about these days, you know, it's almost become a really common vernacular to say, oh, I'm going to manifest this, this thing or that thing. But in this podcast episode, you were talking about manifestation versus magical thinking. And I wanted to touch on that a little bit and get your, some of your thoughts. And what do you think manifestation is? What role do you think it plays in us attaining our goals and our visions for what we want in our life? So the first time I heard the term manifestation was through watching the secret movie. So I watched the movie before I read the book. And then, and I'm sure I watched the movie because Oprah recommended it. And so the idea of cutting out magazine pictures and then thinking about it and praying on them and wishing upon it was all that needs to happen. And then they would just magically come true was fun for me because I am a daydreamer. I mean, my whole life, I've always been told, Steffi, get your head out of the clouds and Steffi, pay attention and all this kind of stuff. And in class and in church, I was told to stop letting my mind daydream and wander. So I was fascinated by the idea of manifestation. Where people get stuck is that they don't take the baby steps forward to make the thing happen. If you've got an idea and a vision for your life or for a future part of your life that you are trying to quote unquote manifest, you can't just sit on a mountaintop and, and think and hope and pray all day and not do anything about it. That's the disconnect. And, and so I teach slow living and, and there's five steps to slow living. And the first one is to get rid of the things that aren't serving you. But two is to kind of program your metaphoric GPS and know where you're heading. So yes, daydream, vision board, journal it out. It's okay to dream big. It absolutely is. And then three, pay attention to the here and the now. Stay present and positive as much as you can. And then four, teeny, tiny baby steps. And, and for me, it's 10 minutes here and there of, of making things happen. So I wanted to write. I wanted to do different things. So then set a timer, spend 10 minutes connecting with people on LinkedIn, send an email to a publisher, figure out who the editor is of the local magazine that you want to write to, actually do the thing. Don't just daydream about it. You have to actually do something about it. And then five, you're, you're just tweaking and, and fine tuning. Manifestation is like one of the top Googling terms right now, and people are trying to manifest a life partner and manifest a dream job and, and manifest, I don't know, what is it, the picket fence and the 2.3 kids and the golden retriever in the yard. But all of those things take decisioning on a, on a basic human level to make the things happen. I mean, the golden retriever isn't going to show up unless you start 
researching rescue organizations in your area and starting to make connections that way. So, so that's how you get the, the abstract idea of manifestation and the magical thinking and, and kind of push them together to make your dreams come true. And it, it sounds trite. It sounds, it sounds silly, but that's really how I think about it. What are your thoughts? Well, I think very similarly, if you have a desire, a really deep desire that's sustaining, that, that sticks with you like throughout years and phases of your life, you know, you're going to naturally do things in that direction. I think, I think it's just, you, just human, you know, you're going to, you're going to gravitate towards that. You're going to research it, look for it. And that's how things open up. And maybe some of that, those steps are more unconscious than you think. But if things are not happening, not moving in that direction at all, and you feel like this goal or vision is very far away and something that you don't see you're making any progress towards, then, yeah, like you say, just start consciously. Like, what can I do today? Some small thing that moves me in that direction. And then, you know, create some velocity around it, some momentum around it. And, and again, people don't have a, a lot of extra time in the day, generally, just like you say, baby steps. And that's how it, kind of it's been in my experience. I find myself like thinking about something I want to attain. I find myself dipping into it here and there and even sort of just haphazardly. And then after a certain period of time, you create kind of a trajectory that so is it woo -woo? a little bit <laughs> I don't know so, yeah but it does feel nice I like the I like the phrase of the universe will meet me halfway or God will meet me halfway so but I'm going to do my part and then trust that something bigger than me will take over and, and that feels good it is a little woo um but I'm a little woo yeah <laughs> I think too going back a little earlier and relating it back to what we're talking about now when you guys were talking about how long some things take and not very like not in a, oh, that took so long, but in a like delightfully surprised, like, oh, I actually did do that. And, you know, that's something that was occupying my hopes and dreams for a long time. I think that as young people and a young person with constant access to, we're just like obsessed with before and after and like imagery, speaking of, as you said, Stephanie, like the imagery and these short form videos of just look at this ugly corner and then how I made it cute and you know, look at my body transformation and all of the, like there's, speaking of slow living, we forget that there is such value in things taking a long time because literally even TikTok hasn't even been around, what, you know, 2017 or 2018 or something. And the kids will try and show me something and, and I get it. I, I understand it. Yeah. But I, I don't, I know. It's jarring. I just... But I just think so much of how the huge portion of the population that's consuming media is consuming it. It's very based on look how fast this happened or here's this thing I want. A lot of TikTok, a lot of what is so attract, not just TikTok, but Pinterest and Instagram and anything else that's like, oh, I like looking at that because I want that can make you feel both inspired and excited, but also like you don't have that. And how fast can I get that? And what do I buy to get me that? And I don't know. I just think that there's not a good way yet besides, I guess, writing about it and sharing about it honestly to sort of like feel okay with not having things yeah. yet. No, it, it's tricky. So so it's it's deciding to be okay with where you are while still actively working towards and hoping for more. So when you're scrolling Amazon and you hit that, this is what I want button, and then you're just done. You just now are trusting that the order will be placed and someone in the warehouse is going to fulfill it for you. And someone's going to put it in a box and someone in the blue van is going to bring it to your house. And you're not hopefully obsessively checking the tracking over and over and over again. And you've moved on now to something else because you know this is on the way to you is really the the correct frame of mind to get into. And it'll get here when it gets here. If there's a snowstorm and the Amazon trucks can't drive for a week or two, okay, it, it's fine. It, it just will get here. I am a huge fan of journaling. And I actually, I have a, a one-page journaling worksheet that if anyone wants to download, they can. I can send you the link. But what I 
talk about when I'm trying to manifest something. And again, manifest, I'm putting it in quotes because it is a buzzy term, but you do have to do some work to get there. And the idea is how do you want to feel? What is it you're trying to achieve? Because everyone thinks the reason they want something is because it will make them feel better than how they feel right this very second. And so if you can kind of tap into that feeling. Maybe it, it's a feeling of fulfillment. Maybe it's a feeling of confidence. Maybe it's a feeling of contentment. If you can tap into that now and then get there and hold on to it for a little bit. And then in this journaling worksheet, I say, okay, how will you create this feeling for yourself today? How will you feel accomplished today? How will you feel confident today? And then, and then those are the steps to take to get there. And it and it does. It takes time and it seems very metaphysical sometimes and it doesn't really make sense. And and so what Mary was talking about is then once you're older, you have this huge wealth of wisdom and you can look back at like gosh, when I was 25, I was so worried that I would never have a house and I would never have this and I would never have a dream job. But now I'm now I'm 54 and I'm thinking, "Huh, it actually didn't take all that long." to begin with. And and so so that wisdom does come with age, but it also comes with starting to collect evidence that you have created things seemingly out of thin air for yourself mm-hmm. and, and then paying attention to that and patting yourself on the back like, huh, I knew I wanted to be a business lady one day. And now all of a sudden I'm looking at myself and I've got a 9 a.m. meeting and I'm going to walk in with my with my new outfit and this awesome briefcase. And I am a quote unquote business lady that and it just it just happened. I love the illustration about the Amazon <laughs> order. I love that because that is the mindset. You say, okay, I'm I'm going to get this and you click and, you know, okay, it's on its way. And you don't carry it around all day like, I wonder where my package is. You don't do that. Well, sorry to keep harping on this, but you don't like watch videos of other people getting their packages. <laughs> Some people do, like, aren't there channels of that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, what I was going to say, Emma, is what you were talking about there is interjecting that feeling of lack. Yeah. Now that mm-hmm. does get in the way. I think that does get in the way of the manifesting. Like if you're going to focus on that, it's things you don't have. It does not open these magical yeah. channels yeah. for allowing the other thing in. I, I really believe that. And I think in the whole social media culture, that is that is a problem because we look at things and we compare, you know, compare and despair is that what they call it. And that despair is a feeling of lack. Like they have this, I don't have it. So I think that that does get in the way. That does get in the way of us working towards and taking steps towards things we envision for ourselves and our lives and the lives that we really want. I, we, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. It is a really expensive area to live. I grew up here. My husband grew up here. When we got married and had children, we moved away. And that was in order to get our feet wet in the housing market. We had pretty much everyone tell us, if you move away, you'll never afford to move back. And we ignored that and just continued doing everything we needed to do in order to come back because that was always what the end goal was. We just knew we were going to come back. And so we ignored the naysayers and just kind of kept our head down and did our own thing. When we moved back, we moved into a much smaller house than we had when we were able to move away into the Central Valley. And I knew it wasn't our forever house. I knew that, but I also knew that it was okay and it was fine. And it was the stepping stone to get to where we would eventually go. And so Sometimes you're you're watching house hunters and and they're going on and on like, well, it doesn't have granite. I could never live here. So so that's one mindset that was not ours. Ours was we'll we'll take what we can get. We're just happy to be back. We now live in a house five houses away from that first house, and that first house we had been in for five six years. And I vividly remember cleaning up after a Christmas morning with three little kids in the house. And it looked like Toys R Us vomited all over the living room. And I had that thought. It was so strong and concrete. And and I was certain. And I thought, we're not doing this again. This is our last Christmas in this house. And then I I put that thought away because still 
great house, great neighborhood, great kids, great school. Everything's fine. We ended up moving to this house five, five houses away in November of that year. We had Thanksgiving in this house. I had no idea. The realtor happened to send a postcard in the mail to us. We couldn't figure out how they got the square footage in this size lot. And it just completely and totally crazily lucked out. So that's one example of manifesting this particular house. Another example was I'm a huge journaler and my husband is also. And often we have these kind of like state of the union dates where it might sound dorky, but quarterly or so we look over the budget and retirement accounts and different things. And then we kind of jot down five-year plans or 10-year plans. And I didn't realize this, but he had written that he would like a six-bedroom house. Well, a six-bedroom house in this area is absurd. No one has a six-bedroom house. This house happens to be now, 10 years later from when he had first written this, according to to Zillow, has six bedrooms. We don't use six bedrooms because one is an office and one is the playroom, which now has turned into the dog's room. But he, quote unquote, manifested this alongside me thinking, this is the last time I'm going to be in this house for Christmas. And both of those things came true, but we weren't actively daily obsessing or complaining. We liked our life. We liked everything about it. And we just kept moving forward. But we were sort of this like coiled spring ready to go when this house fell in our lap. We had still continued to save. We had still continued to be frugal. And so we were then able to jump. And so, yes, from an outside point of view, I absolutely could go on TikTok or something and say, I manifested this. Yeah, that reminds me a lot, mom, of how you got the farm, which is like so also kind of a manifesty weird story. Yeah, that played out over a very long period of time. But then when it actually happened, it was very short. Oh, right. It just like clicked right. Yeah. And it was like, I remember at the time you said like, you and dad were saying like, this is so weird because this makes no sense on paper. And yet it makes a lot of sense for us to do this right now. Yeah. So crazy. And that, and you, as you said, the dream played out over a really long time. Yeah. It's something I, I just held close and in my mind and played around with. And I remember like when my kids were really little and, you know, I always wanted a vague kind of desire. It wasn't really specific, but I wanted base around me, land to kind of play on. I wanted to be in nature, I always envisioned being able to just walk out my own door and take very, very long walks without having to fight traffic or cross streets. And I mean, where do you find that? Like nowhere? And it's just an idea I held in my mind And when my kids were little and, you know, I might have a couple of hours in the afternoon when they were like somewhere else or if they were babies and could nap in the car or whatever. I would drive around and look at all these places and I never really saw the thing that was it. You know, it just never, never was quite it. And so I did this for years and years. And the kids grew up kind of knew, knowing I had this in my mind. And I remember one of my sons even saying, mom, I don't, I'm not sure it exists because you never, you never see it. I don't know. That's kind of of him. <laughs> so then long story short, this place pops up like what, 11 years ago now, 12, I like that. And it was it. And it felt good. Oh, yeah. It just like, okay, this is it. And it, it felt like it then and it feels like it now. It's wonderful. So it, it's amazing. It's, it, it, it is a good feeling. And it is a good feeling. And I think that is how to create that kind of elusive, what sometimes feels far away feeling in the here and the now as best you can. So if you can't get a farm right now, it's okay. But put some plants on your porch and, and, and do something now to help cultivate that feeling. Oh my gosh, that's so true. In our last chat, and this is a little bit of like coaching maybe, you were chatting about how you help people sort of reverse engineer what they want and their dreams. And we were talking a lot about consumerism in that conversation as well and how we like to consume things to sort of fill that gap. As we're talking about right now, we're sort of in this place of like, well, you know, you fill that gap that you have by, first of all, not focusing on the gap that it is, but focusing on the thing that you want and then living into that in what ways you can and sort of being satisfied that way. But I guess to frame it a little bit differently, what if we're having a hard time even figuring out what it is that we want? Because I think that if we spend a lot of time in this consumer mindset and on TikTok, (laughs) my favorite thing to talk about, I think it's hard to know what we actually want and to separate that from what they, capital T, want us to want. 
So I wonder as a coach and as someone who helps people with these sorts of things, how do you help people figure out what they want if they don't know? Or maybe they think that they know, but it's totally different from what they actually want. Isn't that a song? Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I'll tell you what you want, what you really, really want. (laughs) It's interesting because you're not going to find that answer. And so I am a huge fan of unplugging and going quiet and going within preferably in nature, if you're able to do that. But I am really leaning into the acronym for slow that I came up with in some writing. And it's simply look only within. And so when you're quiet, and you're calm, and you ask yourself these kind of open ended questions, what do I want? What's the next thing to do? What's the next best step? What is the universe trying to tell me right now? And then just going quiet and listening your subconscious is going to give you the answer. And depending on your on your faith and your beliefs, maybe that is the voice of God or, or the universe. Could be your subconscious, your intuition. But I think deep down inside, you really do kind of have an inkling of what feels right. And when you follow that path, you usually don't regret it. Wayne Dyer used to say, don't die with the music still left in you. And I think we all know deep down inside what lights us up and what brings us joy. For, for me, it's connecting with other people, helping them, letting people know that they're not alone and that there's nothing wrong with them. And, and if you feel a void and an emptiness, it can be filled usually by just, again, asking yourself really open-ended questions and then listening to the answer and, and doing it without judgment. You're also very enthusiastic about getting things out of the way so you can kind of hear those inner voices. So you want to talk about that a little bit, maybe even like emotional decluttering or physical decluttering your spaces. It's interesting. I just interviewed a woman and she said that your mind looks at clutter as unfinished tasks. And so it's just like like constant reminders of, I got to send that off or, oh, I got to mend that pocket or, oh, I've got to do this and, oh, I've got to do that. And so it's more things for your brain to process. And so for me, I am calmer in a decluttered space. Not everyone. And everyone's version of clutter is a little bit different. So again, that's getting to know yourself and your wants and needs. Some people feel really cozy in a room lined with bookcases and large Afghan throw blankets and and pillows. And other people don't look at a bookcase as one thing, but their brain actually looks at all of the different books as different items. So so it's it's really getting to know you and what your comfort level is. I am a fan of the less is more and being able to find things quickly and easily in my home for me is a marker of organization. If the kids want to know where the roll of scotch tape is and the scissors, I know where they are. And, and honestly, they're old enough that they should know where they are too. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, in my house, <laughs> mom would say, you should know. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any practical advice for people to approach that that problem, which I think every, we all have to a certain extent. And because, you know, we, we're surrounded by entreaties to buy all the time. And even those of us that are super conscious about our purchases, if for one, I'm speaking of myself, I, I still have too many items in my house. And I'm you know, acquiring more items because we just cleaned out my parents' place. And so got to go through that and figure out what to keep from that and what to, you know, give away. And that it's really hard. Yeah, it is really hard. And it's personal and sentimental items have layers of things in them. And it's got guilt. It has nostalgia. It has wistfulness. So paying attention to those things, especially when you're, when you're decluttering items, from someone who has passed on or someone who needs to downsize and just being aware of the situation. I'm not a huge fan of rules of telling people like, okay, well, in your kitchen, you should have these 10 items and, and that's it. Again, it's probably one of the reasons I'm not the best marketer in the world. I shy away from clickbaity kind of titles because I really do think everything is personal and there's not one black or or white one size fits all solution. That's really why I like that acronym for slow of simply looking only within and asking yourself, am I okay getting rid of this? Is this necessary? Is this not necessary? I mean, I mean, if it's silly and it's like a broken bread 
tag tie. Like for some reason, I opened the drawer under the microwave today and there were three of them. Like that's a no brainer. Just get rid of those. But other things that need some time and, and thoughtfulness, I would probably set a timer for 10 or 15 minutes and then slowly go through in those 10 minutes. And then when you're done, you're done and then move on to something else. So it doesn't create such a heavy feeling in your body. I just read this great book. If anyone listening hasn't heard of it yet, it's called How to Keep House While Drowning. And it's by Casey Davis. Sounds a little dramatic, but it's specifically for neurodivergent and ADD, undiagnosed, diagnosed people who might be more creative. And I love, she has a few different approaches to this. Similarly to what you were saying, Stephanie, where there's, you know, rules at some some point are not helpful. And what's going to be helpful for one person is not going to be helpful for every other person. And so a couple of like the main points from the book that are just like popping out at me is the first thing she does is she says, we have to remove like not being organized and having some clutter is not like a moral failing. Like there's no like moral chores are morally neutral. So it's not like a clean house means like you're doing good or a cluttered house means it's bad and sort of letting go of that idea. And and it's just, it's just like objective, like, oh, the cluttered house, my brain feels like lots of tasks aren't done. So maybe if I kind of complete some of these tasks, then I can function better in my space. And that's something that I would like to do for myself. Another thing she says on that level is she doesn't call them chores. She calls them care tasks. So like caring either for herself or people in her home, which I love. And then mom, to your question about like advice for getting to a room or decluttering, she says there's only ever five things in a room. One, trash. Two, dishes. Three, laundry. Four, things that have a place. And five, things that don't have a place. And that really helps my brain. So if you're going into a room and there's a lot of stuff going on, you can at least throw away trash collect the dishes, collect the laundry. And you don't have to like do those things. See, that's my problem. I go in a room like, okay, dishes. And then I get the dishes and then I go, and then I'm doing dishes and I'm out of that other room. And then the thing, and then you get to the things that have a place and the things that don't have a place. That is like such a big category. That's so overwhelming. But when you just think about it, like, oh, things that have a place. Okay. Put them back in the place. Things that don't have a place can deal with that. And it's other little, box. I don't know. So that's, that's my contribution to that. I did not write these things or come up with them, but it's a great book that I just finished reading that was enjoyable. Okay. I'm going to look for that book. And, and, I, and I like it. It's interesting. So I do have ADHD. I don't take medication for it. I'm just aware that I have it and I have systems in place because of it. I wrote a book called Clean Less, Play More, and it's essentially what you're describing. And I love putting it in words that you are not like failing morally as a person if you have what someone might deem a quote unquote cluttered home or uncluttered home. I work with a lot of women who are concerned about their time management. And then when I ask if they meet deadlines or if they're late to work, they say no, but they want to be more organized. So then I'm pointing out, well, what you're doing is working for you. So what makes you feel like you have to change or or why do you feel like it? And it, it is, it's this idea of they want to be more productive or cram more and more into their overflowing day. And that's not the marker of a successful life is how much you can cram into one day and check it off the list. And, and, and it's not... You're, you're not ethically superior, you're not morally superior. It, it, you're, you're just wired a little bit differently. And the checklists and the systems and the you have to do it this way or that way really has kind of been created by this capitalistic society that's trying to get us to buy more and consume more. So, I mean, now we've kind of gone full circle of less is definitely more and you're not doing anything wrong. Take whatever I'm saying and Mary's saying and Emma's saying and apply it to your own life. And if you don't, that's okay too. We still like you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, really. (laughs) Yeah. You know, just we always say, you know, whatever we're saying, just whatever works for you. Yeah. And that's so hard because everyone, another like back to the searching outside ourselves for the answers. We just, we're always looking for answers. We're always looking for someone to tell us how to do it. What are your tips? Tell me how to do it. And the really annoying thing is that 
you only you know how and you already you already have the answers <laughs> you just oh so simply look only within yeah oh yeah. that's it's so interesting good. i'm an acronym junkie and it was my grandpa at one point when i was really little i was like 8 maybe he told me what snafu meant and the idea in my little brain that there was a bad word hidden in another word was so fascinating to me. Oh my gosh, I don't know what it even means. What does it mean? So it's situation normal all effed up. But I was scandalized <laughs> that my grandpa told me this. <laughs> and he was in the army, so I think it, it's a, it was a military term. That's so funny. <laughs> I just learned that. Okay, well, there you go. See, you learned something new today. <laughs> Yeah. How about that? And is it? I think SCUBA is an acronym too. Yeah, that's subcutaneous underwater breathing apparatus. See, I told you I'm a total nerd when it comes to this. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's so funny. Speaking of new things, I'm curious in your clientele, people that come to you for life coaching and, and seeking a more slow life. Have you noticed anything different or new since COVID? You know, I'm asking this because I remember when COVID just got going, you know, almost four years ago now, I remember thinking everything's going to be so different after this. We're going to learn so much and you know, nothing will be the same. And now, now that we're clearly on the other side of it, last time we talked to you, we were sort of coming out of it, but now we're post COVID and I'm not sure that much has changed at all. And I'm just wondering if in your clientele, if you see anything or you hear people talking differently at all. People are actually nostalgic over the lockdowns and talking about the family time and the board games and the jigsaw puzzles and the binge watching Gilmore Girls and and all of this stuff that they did because they were forced to lock down and stay together. And yes, there's absolutely nostalgia over that. And, And I think that the coming together as a society that we were all in this together and we were all nervous and, and worried, and we were going through a shared experience. The only other time I can liken it to is after 9-11, when everyone felt like we were all in this together. People were nicer. People were driving better. They're waving at each other. And yes, I believe we sort of intrinsically know that's better than the every day. And that's why we're a little wistful for for wanting something again outside of us to tell us that it's okay to slow down. And I'd like to push back a little and say that you already have our permission and, and you can decide because you are now a full-fledged grown up and, and you can decide to live a calmer slower life. Absolutely. That's so interesting. That wasn't the answer I was expecting. Okay, well, tell me what you're thinking then. (laughs) (laughs) I don't don't know what I was expecting, but more like are people that are coming to you saying like their goals for life are different now since they had that experience of being quiet and listening to themselves and then the world started all back up again and they kind of lost sight of it. I guess that's exactly what you just said. Like they feel nostalgic about being in that place. Yeah. I, so far, most people who want to work with me have a lot of dreams and goals and ambitions and they want them to come true but they want them to come true in a way where they're not sacrificing themselves and their sanity. They still want what they want, <laughs> but they want they want to get there in, in a less frantic way. Yeah, well, you know, for a while you heard that term, the great resignation. So is that like the quiet quitting in the workplace? Yes, I think they're speaking to the same thing, yes. Yeah, and people realizing that it doesn't have to have that breakneck franticness up about it and that there's other ways to seek fulfillment in life and that sort of thing. I like that idea. I'm now in Silicon Valley and I can see that people are being called back to work and it's just as frantic as it was four or five years ago. So I wish something colloquially had changed to to shift society towards that. I think unfortunately the vacant office buildings that are losing money is still what's driving an awful lot of life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering, what do we still have from the lessons learned? Yeah. And like, what's it going to take? Does it have to always be a tragedy or a worldwide years long event? (laughs) You know, but I remember hearing, you know, my heart was so full of joy when, 
you know, we were getting those first news reports that the ocean was cleaning up. Yeah, there, there were, were dolphins you know, in the Potomac River. <laughs> the, the skyline in the big cities was clearing up because of less pollution and less driving. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, something's really happening here, something really important and the seismic shift. <laughs> maybe it is. And like we were talking about, maybe it's just one of these things that isn't apparent yet. And maybe in 20 years it will be. We'll be able to mark. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Look, looking back on it. I remember it in, in 1996, we lived in Atlanta and the Olympics were in Atlanta in 96 and people were very, very worried about the Olympics being in town and the traffic was already so bad there that we just could not imagine how it was going to be with all these visitors from all over the world coming to watch the Olympics and on top of what we already were experiencing in terms of just getting around the city. And so everybody was told to scale back and eliminate unnecessary trips and just be conscious. And everybody did that to the extent. And they upped their public trans transit. Yeah, they provided more public transportation. And so those combined efforts of individuals and the public transportation and so forth, the traffic during those days of the Olympics was a dream. Yeah, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And we were all looking around going, wow, you know, our metro traffic problems have been solved because now people know how to yeah. do it. Now people know <laughs> how to behave. Well, of course, you know what happened. Right after the Olympics. You know, the Olympics were over and then everything went back to crazy and crazier. <laughs> so I guess that's all just to say that I kind of think we all kind yeah. of know what to do as humans. I mean, we just want yeah. to know these. Well, and it's, and it's interesting because we have always had this bit of a anti-colonialism pioneer drive to being American of don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want. And yet we, you're right, for the greater good, we will band together. We, we will save pennies for charity. We, we will do the right thing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but not all the time. When we, yeah, want, when to. we want to. Yeah. What, what, what's in it for me? What is it? What, yeah. Whiff them. See that? Yeah. Whiff them. <laughs> what's in it for me? Yeah. Well, and it's tricky because like in our area and I'm sure anywhere who has that next door neighborhood communication app, they complain constantly about new construction and, and new anything because they want things to stay the same. And it's tricky because some of them already have the house and they already have the quote unquote American dream, but then they're trying to keep actually others from achieving that for themselves. And so that's the NIMBYs, the not in my backyard people don't want some things that some people believe are markers of Americanism and, and the American mm -hmm. dream. And, and you've got yours, how come I can't have mine? And, and, and it's, it's sort of that idea of I climbed the ladder of success and I'm now going to pull that ladder up and you can't, you can't join me up here. And that, that's too bad also. Yeah. Stephanie, unless you have anything else you wanted to touch on, I would love to hear from you personally about like where you are in this moment, sort of what you are dreaming about or what you would like to see, you know, that you're kind of, I guess, for lack of a better word, manifesting or living into. Yeah. Just kind of what you're, what's going on with you? Absolutely. I, I, well, so it's tricky because what I'm going to say is what we've talked about and that I really, really like how things are going and I'm okay <laughs> with, with kind of staying the same and just growing a little bit, but but I know that I can't hit the pause button forever and life will continue to happen around me. So right now I've got two out of the house in college and one that's still home. So I do want to soak up as much time as I have with her that I get to keep her home with me and make memories. But then also I'm very aware that in the next few years, my husband and I will be empty nesters. And so making sure that we're healthy and strong and we've got a solid relationship as we move into those years are, are some of my, my own personal goals is I want to make sure we still are taking care of ourselves. I've heard horror stories of people who in their first few years of retirement spend an awful lot of time with, with medical issues because they're now starting to pay attention to their body and, and in doing that. I don't want that to happen to us or to any of my friends or any of your listeners. I want all of those things to continuously be sort of paid attention to. 
another thing is just little things around the house. If I notice something needs repair or painting, I now have enough life experience and, and home ownership under my belt to know that it's better to tackle those things quickly <laughs> before they get away from you and you get wood rot and termite damage and all that other stuff. So it's just just being aware of the here and the now, but then also continuing to prepare for the future. That's lovely. That's that mindset that helps you achieve that next thing that you have yeah. in mind too, is like being happy where you are. And that, that's, that's part of, that's part of the woo of it, I think, yeah. right? <laughs> we were talking yeah. about. We're, we're just walking around not in that. a purple haze all the time. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's, everything's great. great. And it's not drugs, <laughs> even though it's legal here. It's not, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just not having that, that lack yeah. Yeah. mentality that gets in the way, you know, but anyway, so what do you have in mind for what you're doing with keep it going as it is or. So my friend Jennifer once asked how many episodes I'm thinking I would do when I, when I hit my hundred mark, she's like, well, when are you going to end it? Like, I guess I didn't really have an end mind, but I think I like the idea of a year's worth of episodes. If someone pondered upon this in, in 10 years, it'd be nice to at least have 365 episodes so you could listen to one a day for a year and, and then feel fulfilled. So I think for the podcast, I know I'm inching towards that. And then I can change my mind once I hit that marker. But I like that. And then as far as, as I, I'm super comfortable where we live, I like where we live. We bought in this area with future retirement and older age in mind and that we can walk everywhere. It's a very walkable community. There's the grocery store, the library, the post office, the senior center, the rec center is, is all around us. So that feels good. And, and yeah, it, it sounds maybe to some a little boring, but we're I'm quite fulfilled. I get a lot of entertainment out of Sheldon the dog and, and just, so it's just kind of fun. <laughs> so, you know, since we've last talked to you and you've started your podcast, what do you have to say about something you've learned about slow living? Yeah, I, I think we touched upon it an awful lot of using that acronym to simply look only within. And I think it's, it's tuning out the noise and the nonsense and not succumbing to hustle culture where you're feeling less than or behind, but, but really owning who you are right here, right now. And it doesn't mean that you can't have aspirations in your personal and professional life and you can't meet goals, but you'll get there when you get there. And again, if we're lucky, life is long. And yes, you can get hit by a bus tomorrow, but, but a marker of, of a well-lived life is not how quickly you get through your to-do list. It, it's fine. Take it slow. Enjoy the people and just enjoy living the life that you're lucky enough to live. There's many people, unfortunately, who aren't anywhere near as well off as you are. If you're listening to this, obviously, you've got earbuds, you've got a smartphone, you've got internet access, and you're pretty gosh darn lucky. Yeah, that's true. And Stephanie, one more thing. Do you have anything else to add about what the good dirt means to you? I don't know. I think we talked about it last time. Whenever I hear of good dirt, I think of my father-in-law and his compost pile that when he like flips it over, there's worms in there and he's like, oh, that's some good dirt. And so, and so it's, yeah. it's like movement <laughs> and life and growth when I, when I think of his composting and, and the worms and you're not dead yet. So yes, like, like, like keep, keep, keep <laughs> going. You're, you're not dead yet. There's plenty of time. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> that's great. This is great. All right. So thank you for joining us. Stephanie, what a treat. Yes. And what a wonderful conversation and enlightening and fun and really appreciate your coming <laughs> back. Very reassuring conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. tuning in, calling in, and spreading the good dirt. We love hearing from you. You can reach our listener voicemail at 443-459-1950. That's 443-459-1950. You can find this number in our show notes and in our Instagram profile. This show is produced by Lady Farmer, a slow living lifestyle community. And the original music is composed and performed by John Kingsley. For more from Lady Farmer, follow us on Instagram at WeAreLadyFarmer. 
That's We Are Lady Farmer. Or join us online at www.ladyfarmer.com. We'll see you next time on The Good Dirt. Goodbye.